So this is pain management 101. Uh, hopefully you get a little bit of good information out of this one. Um, basically, uh, this is a little bit about me. Um, my name is Dr. Brian Royer. I'm a board certified functional neurologist. I also have a specialty in sports medicine. I have a whole bunch of different um, certifications and fun stuff and a alphabet soup type of a thing behind my name. Um, been voted best in Toledo five times as chiropractor and alternative medicine practitioner. Um, so uh, there's a decent amount of stuff that I do. And this is part of the reason why, you know, I kind of know my stuff when it comes to doing this, when it comes to pain. So anyway, so let's go ahead and get going. So basically the idea is, is that when it comes to pain, um, first of all, pain in general is something that involves suffering, right? It's suffering, it's discomfort. It's something that's caused by an illness or injury. And basically everybody will experience pain in a slightly different way. So sometimes it can be difficult to define. Sometimes it can be difficult to treat. Um, you know, everybody's got different levels of pain tolerance. Um, some have a lot, some think that they have a lot and they don't actually have a lot. So it just kind of depends on the person. But um, pain is basically our body's way of telling us that something's wrong or something's damaged. And it basically, it plays an important role in order to kind of change our behavior in order to protect us from harmful situations. So the general, like the easiest example is, is that if it comes to touching something hot, fire, a hot stove, whatever, your brain is going to react quickly to signal you to a danger. Some of that ends up being like a reflexive type of a thing. So if you put your hand on a hot stove, you end up having muscle contractions that will automatically pull your hand off of the stove in order to stop it from doing it. But the pain doesn't hit yet. Pain takes a second in order for it to actually like hit our brains in order to do stuff. But the thing about pain is, is that it has to cause suffering in order for it to actually be effective, right? It has to, has to actually like make you fear it, right? So you have to, you know, it, it, in, the, in the moment when it's a reflexive kind of a thing, that's one thing. But later on, when you've learned that you don't want to touch something that's hot, you pay attention to it, you know, you, you know, make sure that you're, you know, not being crazy up into a tree, you know, so that you're going to fall off it. So there ends up being a handful of different things that, that can happen when it comes to pain. The thing that is different, though, is that when it comes to pain, there's acute pain and there's chronic pain. Chronic pain is a little bit different because chronic pain is debilitating. It causes problems with the quality of life and all this other kind of stuff. But chronic pain doesn't really occur because of injury in and of itself. Chronic pain basically occurs, you know, I don't want to say completely in the brain, but it has components to being in the brain and it has different effects than just being something that you need to avoid. So what I mean by that is, is that again, if you touch something that's hot, your brain, you know, like, or if you are thinking about touching something that's hot, your brain has a fear to it. If you do touch it, your brain ends up having the pain from the burn or whatever. And it lasts as kind of like a reminder to help teach you when it comes to chronic pain, like, but the acute pain should go away, right? It shouldn't be something that sits there. Chronic pain, on the other hand, you have it and it just exists. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't help you in any way. So it, there's obviously there's problems when it comes to chronic pain, right? So, you know, we'll get more into that and we'll get more into other things about it, but you know, it's just one of those kind of things to just kind of pay attention to. You know, there's different ways that you can describe pain. People will describe it as like achy, burny, stabby, sharp, shooting. You can have numbness and tingling. Um, you can have throbbing pain. You know, and there's multiple different things that can cause it and some just general causes, you know, especially for musculoskeletal type of stuff is obviously muscle pain. Tension can happen in muscles and joints, stress, overuse injuries, and then obviously like other like minor or even major injuries. 
are all possibilities of things that can cause pain. Um, when it comes to classifying the different types of pain, again, we talked about acute. Acute is pain, and it depends on where you are because it's actually different in Europe. Um, in Europe, they consider acute pain to be up to two weeks. In the US, we consider acute pain to be up to six weeks. Subacute pain is going to be the area that's in between acute and chronic. So for, you know, in America, um, in the US, we look at it being about six weeks to three months. And chronic pain is going to be pain that lasts anywhere from three months, six months, and then anything that's beyond that. Now, there's a couple of different categories of pain of, of like what can cause it from a you know, not just a sprain strain kind of a thing, but like what's actually the cause of the pain or what generates the pain. One of them is going to be tissue damage or what we would call nociceptive pain. And so that can be different things like osteoarthritis, strains, sprains, mechanical types of back pain, post-surgical pain, those kind of things, right? So sprain strains, damage, like if you get a cut, those kind of things, that's all pain that's associated with tissue damage. The, another one would be inflammation or inflammatory pain. And when it comes to acute inflammation, that is going to be something that is driven by chemicals, partly by the immune system. So you end up having things like, you know, things that are the, the, that would be acute pain would be things like rheumatoid arthritis, gout, psoriatic arthritis. So somebody that has psoriasis develops arthritis because of that, that's due to inflammation. And it has a, it, it, again, it's chemical driven and it's driven partially by the immune system. And so in many of those cases, it ends up being an autoimmune issue. But things that are, are characteristic of inflammation would be things like redness, stiffness, swelling of joints, different things like that. So if you imagine like, you know, getting a cut that gets infected, that inflammation that's there, the redness, the stiffness, the swelling, um, you know, it being hot, those kind of things would all be indicators of inflammation. And then another type would be nerve pain or neuropathic pain. So different types of neuropathies like diabetic neuropathies would be related to that radiculopathies from um, having a herniated disc or a slip disc or something like that. Uh, trigeminal neuralgia would be another example. And you can end up having a combination of different issues that are going on where tissue damage can ca cause some uh, inflammation or chronic inflammation, which is a different type, which we'll talk about later, can be something that affects it and causes tissue damage. So osteoarthritis is tissue damage, but in many people talk about that as something that is a chronic issue that happens over time. So there's multiple different things that can cause or different types of pain. But one of the things that's interesting is, is that pain is something that has to be perceived in the brain. So when it comes down to it, it's always one of those kind of things that, you know, when I, I teach at Owens and when I teach at Owens and we talk about anatomy and physiology stuff, one of the things that we talk about is perception of things. And it's an interesting kind of a thing where, you know, I, I, I always like to ask the question in the class, and obviously you can't really respond here so much, but when we look at something in class, the thing that I like to look at is, you know, like it, it, the interesting question for me is if, you know, like it's the tree falling in the woods um, question, right? So if a tree falls in the woods and nothing is around to hear it, does it make a sound? And people will give all kinds of different answers on it. So again, if a tree falls in the woods, and nothing is around to hear it, does it make a sound? And some people will say no, because, you know, like that might be the, the, the normal thing. Some people want to be smarter, and then they start talking about how, like, when the tree crashes, it creates reverberations of the air, and the reverberations of the air, that's the sound. But I'll tell them no, it doesn't, because sound is something that is heard or perceived in the brain. Right. So you can end up having that crashing, but if nothing ends up translating the reverberating airwaves with a tympanic membrane or an eardrum and it goes through the different little bones in the ear and it pushes on, you know, it, when you end up having those different areas and it pushes on the cochlea and all that, if it doesn't get converted into something that the brain or someone's brain, then it doesn't make a sound because sound is something that's perceived in the brain. Everybody has heard of, if they've not experienced it, the idea of sounds that you can hear that aren't perceived or aren't caused by anything so whether or not it's something like tinnitus so or tinnitus depending on how you want to pronounce it it when you talk about tinnitus tinnitus is going to be something that is a sound that's produced in the brain that is a sound 
because you're hearing something that's going on, but nobody else can hear it because it's not being caused by the environment. It's being caused only in your brain. So there's other things that happen when it comes to the brain and pain. That's an interesting kind of way to, to kind of like look at it. So let's look a, li look a little bit about how the body registers pain. You end up having sensory receptors that are going to send messages through nerve fibers to the spinal cord of the brainstem. So basically there's different pressure receptors and the pressure receptors and, and the different nociceptive receptors can basically be stimulated by certain chemicals like an in inflammation to make it a little more sensitive. Um, but that's going to go into the spinal cord and into the brainstem. And I'll show you guys a picture in a second of what that looks like. Um, the brain is going to get the message regardless, regarding where the pain is being felt. And then in response to the pain, the pain, the brain is basically going to release chemicals that are called endorphins, which are basically like morphine that can basically help to shut it down. So they talk about how the brain kind of changes in response to acute versus chronic pain, right? So in the, the brain changes how it responds to chronic pain and it changes the different aspects of, of how things get processed. So Sometimes there's reasons why chronic pain, like treatments for acute pain, don't actually help to treat things that are chronic, right? So, you know, again, acute pain is something that is typically more sharp and severe. Again, we talked about how long that it lasts before, and it's usually related to the soft tissue damage. Um, again, chronic pain ends up being something that, you know, the nerve signals continue to fire even after you've healed. So the pain is just, it's not just in the tissue, it's going to be partially located in the brain as well. So acute pain though, and this is the thing that's interesting and the thing that's important is that you need to address acute pain in the right way, because if it doesn't get addressed correctly, then it can end up becoming a chronic pain through a process called sensitization, right? Just like the brain is good at learning how to do movements, you know, if you're learning how to dance and you're learning how to do a movement, the more that you do the movement, the better off at the movement that you're going to be. Typically, if you're trying to learn something, the more repetitions that you go through it, the better off that you're going to be. The brain changes and it goes through this thing called neuroplasticity, and it, that's usually a good thing. But when you talk about pain, you can end up having an increase in the amount of pain, which can basically, um, the, the increasing in the amount of pain is something that neuroplasticity can actually like make worse. And that's an example of bad neuroplasticity, right? So one of the things that's interesting about like pain in the brain is, is that certain things can make it worse. And we'll talk more about stuff later, but again, it's, it has to do with how things are handled sometimes. So one example is, is that if somebody ends up having a surgery, like for example, let's say that somebody has a hip replacement surgery, you know, and they tell you that you need to start walking at such and such a date after, you know, like whether or not it's 10 days or five days or whatever it is, it depends on the type of surgery that you get. So let's say that you're supposed to start walking after a certain period of time. But if a person has maybe like a, what would be considered like a doting spouse, then that can actually make things worse. And what that means is, is that like, let's say that, you know, somebody's like, you know, like, oh, well, you know, like, you know, you don't get up, you stay right there where you're sitting and I'll go make you the sandwich or I'll go do this. I'll go do that. You don't go and do that, that kind of the thing. You know, that's actually something that can make pain worse because it can actually make people think about their pain more. They're not being active. They're not getting up. It's the same kind of thing that happens with people who are older when we're like, oh, you just sit down and I'll take care of it for you. All right. People do that kind of stuff a lot. Actually, the older person probably should get up and they should actually like use their muscles. Right. So there's multiple different things that kind of comes down to it. And that's just one thing. We'll talk more about things that drive pain or things that like drive disability here in a, in a little bit. This picture that's right here, this is talking about a um, this is basically talking about the, the different areas of how pain goes. So this is getting a little bit nerdy when it comes down to it. So you can see my little laser pointer here. And again, you end up having different types of information will come in, but we're going to talk about the pain and temperature one that's here. This comes in, it basically synapses in the backside of the spinal cord. It crosses across the front, and then it's going to ascend up. 
it's going to synapse up in here, up in the, the, the thalamus in the brain. And then it's going to go into the different areas of the brain that actually will perceive it. You don't perceive pain until it gets up and through here. It has different effects in different areas. It can, when it comes across, you can have different collaterals that come off that stimulate like your sympathetics. So when people can have pain, they can sweat and other kinds of stuff like that. But notice you can affect pain here at this level. You can affect pain here at this level because there's descending fibers that will come down and they will affect, not, not these purple ones, and blue ones here but there's motor fibers that will actually come down that bring things like opioids and other things that will actually shut off pain right but this is just a, a general quick kind of thing um, to see how sensory information travels in the body because basically in the spinal cord they're basically like lanes on a highway okay so when it comes to pain, there's things to ask about pain typically that you would get if you go to your doctor. So I'm just going to kind of go through these things. So like if you're ever, you know, need to, to go, these are the kind of things that you should think about, you know, when you make your appointment. So, you know, the things that you can talk and you get some people that know all this stuff and some people have a, a harder time coming up with their history of what, what things have happened. So, you know, for example, one and it's you know it, it's a typical thing of, of the order that we talk about this stuff in right so one of them is going to be the location of where the pain is right so where does the pain hurt like is it a headache is it neck pain is it just on the left side or on the right side or whatever the next one would be what kind of things were you doing at the onset right so when it first started what were you doing did you hurt yourself? Was it a work injury? Was it a car accident? Did you roll over in bed wrong? Right? Or, you know, you know, what kind of stuff happened? Right? So that kind of lets us know a little bit about what's going on. Did it start suddenly? Or was it a gradual kind of thing that happened over hours or days? Again, starting gradually, um, that might, you know, and it, it lasting for a long time, and, you know, and the, the length of time tells you whether or not it's chronic and can give you an idea of like, what kind of stuff um, have been going on right so you end up having uh things like what kind of stuff makes it better and what kind of things makes it worse you also have uh things but what does it feel like when we talked a little bit about this later so what does the pain actually feel like is it sharp is it dull pain is it stabbing is it crushing is it numbness and tingling Do you, is it throbbing what kind of thing is it um it, is it does the pain radiate or does it go from one place to another? So be specific with it. Can you point with one finger to where the pain is or do you have to kind of say that it's a general area? Um, and then does that radiate from one place to another? Does it go down one leg? Does it go down both, but a little bit more on the right than on the left? Um, you know, again, does it go down the arm, what, whatever it is, and then how bad is it? Does it hurt a lot or a little, you know, mild, moderate or severe it, you know, and typically we talk about that scale of zero to 10, um, you know, with 10 being, you know, horrible, unimaginable pain, and then zero being no pain at all. Um, and then the timing, what kind of stuff affects it? Does severity affect it? Does um, it change based on the time of, or like, does the severity or the type of pain differ based on the time of day? Does it base uh, like, you know, on that activities that you're doing on the weather, on the time of year, or the positions that you're in or other kinds of stuff like that. So there's a whole bunch of different things that you can use in order to figure out pain. And that's the questions that I'm going to ask somebody when they first come in when we're, when we're trying to figure it out. When it comes to the causes of chronic pain, chronic pain, you know, again, is one of those things that has the tendency to happen without really much being a, always having an obvious cause. So it can be a result of injury. There can be health conditions that are associated with it. So past injuries, past surgeries, you know, having a history of back problems, having migraines or other headaches, arthritis, having nerve damage, infections, fibromyalgia. Um, there's something that's called uh, um, a, it used to be called reflex sympathetic dystrophy. And now it's basically chronic regional pain syndrome where things can swell up and hurt and have other kinds of issues, right? Um, when it comes to treatments for pain, and this is where we're gonna kind of shift a little bit, there's a whole host of different things that you can do. Some things are more effective than others, but when it comes down to it, there's treatments that you can do for pain, not only by going to somebody who is a healthcare practitioner, but also by going to, you know, doing things for yourself, 
right? So there's a, a handful of different things that you can do. So we're going to go through and talk about a bunch of different stuff. So the main goal that you have when it comes to chronic pain treatment is going to be obviously pain reduction. You want to decrease that pain in order to get it as low as what you can. That's the main goal. But the other thing is, is that we want to reduce the amount that it affects your daily life, right? So sometimes you can still have pain, but as long as you can still do all the activities that you want to, that is, you know, it, that, that's kind of like a decent consolation prize. So there's a lot of different things that you can do. Obviously, there's medication, there's surgery, there's things that you can do for people that aren't really comfortable with medication and surgery, but medication and surgery can be two valid options, right? It depends on the person, it depends on the issue, but in my opinion, the dealing with medication, especially like opioid type of medication or prescription medication, those, you know, in surgery, both of those things should be things that should be you know, put more on the back burner. You should do things that are more um, natural or conservative types of treatment before you start getting into that. So there's a bunch of different types of uh, treatments for pain and chronic pain and acute pain. So one of the first ones, surprise, surprise, that we'll talk about is chiropractic care. And this shouldn't be too much of a surprise that I'll talk about this, <laughs> right? So chiropractic care, if you don't know what exactly it is, again, it is a specialized technique of pain management, where basically you can, uh, you can affect the whole body. So again, people that are looking for a safe and natural and effective approach for pain management, chiropractic could be for you. Basically, what you do is that you try to relieve pain, improve function and mobility, and help patients basically better manage their condition at home. You do an exam, um, you discuss the health history, um, and then you try to figure out any potential causes of pain. And then one of the main kind of treatments that a chiropractor uses is going to end up being the chiropractic adjustment. And the adjustment in and of itself is basically going to be using a controlled sudden force, like a quick movement to a joint in the spine or maybe one of the extremities with the goal to help to kind of fix the movement of the joint to allow it to function as well as what it can. The, it can be a very powerful thing. It can be a very powerful input into the brain. Sometimes it's too much for people. So it depends on the issue. But there's a research that basically shows the, the services that are provided by chiropractors, specifically the chiropractic adjustment, is clinically effective, safe, it's cost effective. There's recommendations from the CDC, the FDA, the IOM, um, which basically call for a shift away from opioid use towards a um, like towards non-pharmacological approaches to chronic pain. The international, or I'm sorry, the American College of Physicians also uses non, uh, or also recommends using non-drug treatments. Um, there's American uh, Academy of Family Physicians has guidelines that basically say that chiropractic is one of the things that are there. So they obviously they talk about physical therapy and some of the other stuff that we'll talk about as well. But there's a whole host of different things that are, are treatments that you can use. There's also a opioid task force that the state of Ohio had um, a few years ago. And that opioid task force um, that was done by the governor at the time basically talked about trying to use more conservative types of treatment like chiropractic to help to decrease pain. So the other things to kind of remember is, is that chiropractic physicians, they're not just the adjustment, right? Chiropractic is not just the adjustment. It's a healthcare field and people that are in that field can use multiple different techniques in order to help to ease the pain. So we'll talk some about that here in a second, but let, let me give you a couple of different um, things here. So 2.7 billion better option to back surgery would be chiropractic. So spinal manipulation was proven in a study that in like back in 2010 or something like that uh, was proven effective, just as effective as microdiscectomy surgery for patients that are experiencing sciatica due to having a lumbar disc herniation, right? That's kind of a big deal. Now, again, not every herniation is going to be able to be fixed by a microdiscectomy. Um, it's not It's not every chiropractic. Uh, you're not going to be able to fix everybody that has sciatic with chiropractic. You can't fix everything with a micro, microdiscectomy. Sometimes you have to have other types of surgeries. But 
again, there's over 200,000 micro discectomies that are performed every year in the US, which costs about $5 billion. And that adds up to about $25,000 per procedure. So if you're going to have one, make sure that your insurance is up and that, you know, like hopefully your deductible isn't too high. But you know, what it comes down to is, is that people that get chiropractic care, there ends up being a savings of around $22,900 per patient that gets adjusted or manipulated compared to having back surgery. So if you add up all those cases, then that's about $2.75 billion annually that you can get. Patients get good results. People get back to work. People have less disability and less problems. So again, it's a pretty good option. Another thing that is a, is a good thing is chiropractic has the tendency to reduce the amount of opioids that people take. So again, there's more people that are living in chronic pain than cancer, heart disease, diabetes combined. It's a huge issue, right? So 130 Americans die every day from opioid related overdoses. Again, way too high, way too much problems with that. Chiropractic is one of those kind of things that helps to cut that down because, you know, a lot of the focus that you have when it comes to opioid addiction ends up coming from the point after they're addicted to it. If you could shut the tap off, right? It's not about just, you know, bailing out the boat, right? Or it's not just about if you could stop the, the water from getting in, you need to stop it first in order to actually like manage the issue. One of the ways that you can do it is by helping to get people to do conservative care. Again, exercises, other kinds of stuff that we'll talk about. And one of the ways that you can do that, again, is having the person see a chiropractor. It helps reduce the amount of opioid prescriptions that are given out. And if you're reducing the amount of opioid prescriptions, you're going to reduce the amount of people that end up getting um, addicted to it. So Anyway, so we talked about some of the different things that chiropractors can do. Again, this is not just physical therapy, but chiropractors also can do therapeutic exercises. When it comes to exercises, again, you can um, get in there and you can inhibit the muscles by doing certain stretching or pe teaching people how to foam roll or do uh, myofascial self-release on, your, on yourself. Um, you can teach people how to lengthen by doing stretches. So lengthening tight muscles, you can get the people to strengthen weak muscles. And then there's also improving muscle coordination and balance, getting people to move in the right way. So there's a whole handful of different things that therapeutic exercises can be used for, um, you know, just let alone getting people active and moving and everything else. Another thing that you can do is something called Graston technique. This is something that I'm certified in. I've been certified since 2010, but I've been doing this since basically, yeah, I, since I graduated from chiropractic school in 2004. Um, chiropractic, or I, I should say Graston technique, it's basically a proven approach to the diagnosis and treatment of soft tissue injuries. So you use these stainless steel instruments that are designed to basically to detect and, and treat areas that have some scar tissue. So things that might have chronic inflammation or issues in the muscles, the tendons, the ligaments. And basically you can use the treatment on it to reduce pain and restore function. So Graston technique is effective in the treatment of joint sprains, low back pains, muscle strains, post-fracture pain, tendonitis, you know, plantar fasciitis. There's a whole host of different things that it can help with. So the connective tissue basically gets damaged. It starts to get inflamed. The inflammation starts to produce scar tissue. The scar tissue can produce myofascial adhesions that can basically stick to different areas around that and reduce the motion and reduce the flexibility and cause pain and tenderness. Graston technique lets you actually feel where those areas are because you can actually, when you go across it, you can feel the, um, you can feel the grit in the muscle or in the tendon or the ligament where people end up having problems. So you can focus the area where you actually need to have the treatment as opposed to random areas. So the instrument, after you can feel it, you basically can help break up the restriction or adhesion and people get pain reduction and improved function with usually within the first couple of treatments. You know, obviously it's not gone, but you can continue to get that. The number of times that I will have somebody that has like a decent amount of neck pain and I'll adjust them and that helps. But when you get in there and grasp in them, 
um, they can feel that change in that, you know, range of motion so that they can actually check their blind spot, like when they're driving and stuff like that. Another thing that you can use in order to help with pain is something called kinesio tape. And people have seen this, um, you know, usually at the Olympics, which is where I got all these pictures from, basically, you know, you have multiple different, except for the, the dancer there. But uh, basically, Kinesio taping is a system of taping that you use to treat a variety of clinical conditions. Um, it can do different things. So you can improve circulation, lymphatic flow. You can drain out bruises and stuff, which I'll show you in a second. You can improve muscle function. You can improve the way that the joints move and you can improve the way that the, the, the fascia actually functions. There's a lot of different stuff with it. It seems like it's complete voodoo, but it's crazy how it actually works. You can actually put the tape on people and I've had people that have had full on muscle tears that did need to end up having surgery but when they ended up having the tape on, they had full range of motion, but without the tape, they could barely move their shoulder. So kinesio tape is one of those things that's really, really cool, but it's not like a long-term solution. So people need to know what they're doing when it comes to the tape. A lot of people will look at stuff online and that, and try to like use the tape, but you need to actually like fix the problem and not just kind of like cover it up. So you need to do more than just doing the kinesio tape. You need to do things beyond that. But kinesio tape is something that can actually help people like move around at home or like, you know, not have major increases in pain or uh, allow the, the runner to continue training for the marathon when they have plantar fasciitis. Well, it, it can help to reduce the effect on that. So this next one is pretty cool. This is a, a picture that I, I took. Um, this is basically of someone's butt but it's uh, got it covered up so you can't really see it very well. But the idea is, is that this person, just like it says, they fell off of horse, uh, they fell off a horse and basically landed on a jump um, when they were trying to jump. The, the horse decided not to jump and stopped and basically uh, the rider fell off and landed on their butt, breaking the jump. So um, again, this taping, again, you can see how you got nasty little bruise that's in through here. You end up having the bruise with a little bit of movement that's here. And then again, after about 10 days, you can end up having that disappear. This would end up being um, something like the third or fourth day, there ended up being no pain. You still see the bruising, but you can end up having a severe reduction in the amount of pain. This shows how I was doing some of the taping here, where we were going across in different ways. And again, by you know 14 days or two weeks into it, you end up having very little bruising that's left over. So it's kind of cool how that kind of stuff actually works. So I've done that multiple times on like people that have had torn hamstrings and stuff, and it, it can really, really work. So um, there's certain other things. There's other like uh, modalities and stuff like that that you can do. Some people will use electric stimulation. Um, again, you can use it during chiropractic therapy. You can reduce inflammation with it. It can reduce muscle spasms. It can help to relieve pain. Um, again, you basically put electrodes on and it basically helps to, to kind of stimulate the formation, uh, depending on how you use it, it helps to stimulate the formation of certain kinds of chemicals that can reduce some pain. So there's other things like intersegmental traction tables and inversion tables that people can use as well. Um, massage is obviously something that's important. So um, you can get that as part of a chiropractic session, or you can do it separate from that. Um, you know, uh, this could be, you know, going to a massage therapist. So again, soft tissue massage is going to help to improve circulation. It can reduce swelling. It can reduce inflammation that's associated with the pain. It can encourage quicker healing. Um, you don't necessarily have to use salt and stuff like that that's shown in this one. Um, regular stuff will work, but um, there's a whole handful of different things. Um, that, that can help when it comes to massage. And it is very effective at helping to reduce sore muscles, um, you know, which is why we use it on a regular basis in our office. Um, something else that we have in our office that other offices have as well is cold laser therapy. <clears throat> so in cold laser therapy, um, it can also be known as a uh, uh, low level laser therapy or photo uh, photo biomodulation, which is fun. Um, but basically it is safe. It's research proven. Um, I bought it because the research on it is actually really, really good on helping to improve 
um, people's pain. Uh, the therapy is approved by the FDA and it can basically reduce inflammation and can reduce pain. Um, the, the difference in why they call it a cold laser is, is that it's different from the other lasers that you see that can actually like cut. So that like the aesthetic lasers to help like, you know, basically get rid of like hair, um, like hair removal stuff or surgical later lasers, those can be basically designed to cut tissue or kind of injure the tissue because it's really, really intense. But photobiomodulation basically, um, it produces biological effects on the tissue Again, relief of pain, acceleration of the healing process, increased cell proliferation, promoting tissue regeneration, it prevents cell death, and anti-inflammatory types of activities. It's dose dependent, so the more light that you get, um, the more um, you know reduction in the pain that you can get. Um, and again, it help, the thing that's also cool about it is that it also has very little side effects. So there's basically no risk that's associated with it. You know, basically the only people that you don't want to use it on are pregnant people and somebody that has cancer, you know, pretty much. Um, you know, it, it's, it sounds like it's crazy and a little bit of voodoo, but basically the photons that you are putting in, so the little light packets that you're putting in, those have energy that's associated with them. And it's not exactly like photosynthesis, but the energy goes in and it actually like activates parts of your mitochondria as it hits in and it starts to stimulate an increase in the amount of energy that your body is making. So things depend on the wavelength and other kinds of stuff, but um, it is basically energizing the electron transport chain if you want to get nerdy about it within the mitochondria and it, and it basically makes more ATP. It increases uh, the amount of, um, or I should say it decreases the amount of free radicals and it increases the amount of transcription factors and all that kind of stuff leads to increased healing. Okay, so cold laser is pretty cool. Uh, next thing that we'll talk about here real quickly is cupping therapy and cupping therapy, and you can call it myofascial decompression because it can be done as different things. Um, you know, if it's done as part of like a traditional Chinese medicine type of a treatment, you definitely call it more of like a cupping therapy, but basically what it's doing is it is helping to decompress the fascia. So one of the things that we'll do, obviously, like I talked about Graston technique is kind of getting in there and kind of compressing and stretching out tissue and other kinds of stuff. But you also have the ability to actually like lift up the tissue and separate it or decompress it. So it's used on muscle groups or fascial planes. It doesn't have to be used on acupuncture points or meridians like what it would be used for somebody who's doing acupuncture or traditional Chinese medicine. So it will get in there and it will help to stretch muscle and connective tissue. It can increase the elasticity and elasticity and fascia and the muscles. Basically, it can help just kind of like Graston technique and like myofascial, you know, therapy stuff. It will help to in, basically loosen up adhesions in the muscles and the joints. It can decrease stiffness and arthritis. It can help you increase your range of motion in the joint. And all that kind of stuff can help to decrease pain. So there's all kinds of different things that are there. Uh, the next one to talk about, and I'll talk about this briefly, it's not something that I do, but it is something that can be effective. Um, acupuncture, again, is going to be an, another type of alternative treatment. Um, chiropractors need to be especially trained to do it. You can also get somebody who's a licensed acupuncturist who is going to have way more training than, uh, than a chiropractor will. Um, basically, it's another traditional Chinese therapy. You have these thin little needles that you stick in. They don't really hurt. They're really, really tiny. Um, you know, usually there's some places that they can hurt. Don't get, don't get me wrong, but, <clears throat> but the needles can increase blood flow. They help relieve pain. Um, in China, they'll actually do needling for some anesthesia for certain surgeries and stuff, which is crazy, but there's all kinds of different things. And some people will do something called dry needling, which is a different variation of acupuncture. Okay. So that's that. Now that's some of the stuff that you have people that you do to you right? What's important is, is that there's other things that you can do in order to help to self-manage your pain, right? So when it comes down to it, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's there. So individuals need to become an active participant in your pain treatment. If you're not active in it, and if you're just expecting people to get you better, then your outcomes aren't going to be as good. 
like self-management programs will reduce the amount of um, of problems that people can have coping with their pain. Um, you know, you can have uh, self-management programs that will help to teach you different methods of thinking about and responding to your pain. The, the more action that you take, the more things and the more ways that you're involved in helping to decrease your pain, the more effective that it can be. So certain things that you can do would be helping to build a partnership with your healthcare provider, right? Again, you know, it is a two-way street. It is both of you working in order to try to get you better, right? They should be obviously interested in getting you better and hopefully spending more than five minutes with you. Um, but that's one of the things that's there, but it's, you know, obviously both people working together. You should use your medications appropriately when you do have them, right? So again, not overusing them, right? That, that's a, a big issue. There's a cognitive and behavioral strategies, which I'll talk a little bit more about here in a second, that you can, that, that you can use as well. Because again, how you perceive your pain and the behavior that you have also determines the amount of pain that you can have. And again, getting help with the emotional consequences of chronic pain is a big deal. And I'll, again, I'll talk about that more here in, here in a second. But for the best results, again, you need to talk with your healthcare provider. You, you know, again, come with questions. Um, again, help to address barriers that you might have and try to help encourage you in order to get you better. Right. So besides just the, the pain stuff, because we talked about the things before, like the inflammation driving pain and like the nociceptors driving pain. Right. So like tissue injury driving pain. There's other things that happen when it comes to pain, especially in somebody that has chronic pain. So when it comes down to it, people that have chronic pain have other challenges that, uh, that, that can be obviously a big deal. Managing symptoms is obviously a big part of it. One thing that kind of, there's different things that you can find out, like when someone comes in, that kind of gives you an indication of how well things are going, especially if somebody has chronic pain. So one thing when it comes to managing your symptoms, people will sometimes have the opinion that if you have any increase in pain, that that's an indication that you should stop what you're doing until the pain goes away. And that's actually poor thinking. So managing symptoms doesn't mean that you are going to have no pain at all. It means that you're trying to manage it. You don't want the pain to be sky high, but having a slight increase in your pain, that doesn't necessarily mean that you need to stop what you're doing, right? Another thing is, is that again, any physical activity that makes your pain worse, you know, again, that's another way to kind of look at it. You don't want to necessarily avoid physical activity when you have pain because movement is such an important part of actually like shutting pain down, right? So there's things that you need to do to modify your responsibilities. There's different things that you can do to help cope with the negative emotional consequences. So anxiety, depression, distress, anger, all of those are different things that are negative emotional consequences. And sometimes you need to have somebody that you can talk to that, again, not your chiropractor necessarily, somebody who's actually like trained in dealing with the emotional stuff. So having somebody who is a, a therapist, whether or not it's a psychologist or a counselor or different stuff like that, because one of the things that's really interesting, you know, it's unfortunate, but it's interesting is, is that people that have a lot of, you know, like the depression and pain go together. People that end up having a lot of pain end up developing depression because they don't have the ability to do things that they want to do. Besides doing that, you end up having issues where that depression leads to more pain because you don't do the things that you need to do. So it ends up being the self-fulfilling cycle of pain leads to depression and depression leads to more pain. And it just keeps kind of spiraling out of control. So not only do you need to deal with it from a physical standpoint, but you also need to deal with things from a mental standpoint. Again, chronic pain sufferers, uh, they will often suffer because they don't have full control over their own life and they have to rely on others to help with, sometimes with even with mundane tasks. Again, this is going to be why some of the reasons why self-management is, is aiming to help people regain some control. That's a big thing. People that don't feel like they have any control over their pain, they end up not doing well dealing with it. Um, they don't do well with managing it. 
you know, other things like hopelessness doesn't help as well. So people that have a poor outlook. So if I ask you whether or not you're going to be working in six months and you say no, then it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Same kind of thing of, you know, like if I ask you whether or not you're going to have trouble sitting or standing in six weeks, if you say that, yeah, you're going to have a load of trouble standing, you're not going to be able to do it. Again, it ends up being a little bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you think that you're going to be able to do it and you take the steps towards hitting that goal, then you're going to be more likely to be able to do it. So there's other kinds of drivers. So we talked a little bit about the emotional stuff. So there's pain, but then there's disability. There's the difference between somebody hurting and the, the, the difference between that actually like changing and affecting their life. So you can have emotional things that we talked about. You can also have cognitive things. So the way that you think about pain, some people will catastrophize and just everything is like, oh my goodness. Um, you know, and again, it needs to be kind of like in the middle, like you don't want to downplay pain too much and hide it, but you also don't want, you know, it's not, you know, somebody like I've touched people before barely. And then it's, you know, they, they let out screams that's not necessarily like appropriate reactions the way that things are are you know your expectations of what you're going to be you know again that whole outlook of what's going to happen in six months or six weeks that plays a role the fear that you have of movement is a big deal so a lot of people just don't want to move and that fear of movement means that they don't and it means that they end up being more likely to actually have pain if you can end up kind of getting over that to a degree and not going crazy, somebody that has chronic pain doesn't need to do crazy, crazy things, but they should start slowly doing a little bit of movement and starting to go from there. Other things like comorbidities can have an issue. So people that have diabetes are harder to control, like uh, to tell, control pain. People that end up having cardiovascular issues or migraine stuff, sleep disturbances or other kind of mental health disorders, all of those things can end up being um, things that can affect your pain and make it so that it might be harder, right? But it doesn't mean that you can't control it. So there's other self-management techniques that we'll get into and we'll kind of go through this. Uh, I don't want to go, I don't want to speed through it too much, but um, uh, I'll go through some of these here, um, some of these different techniques. So one of the things ends up being effective pacing. So a lot of times people will have good, good days and bad days. Um, you can end up having a situation where sometimes pain can be really debilitating on bad days. And then, if in, and then when they end up having a good day, a person will have the tendency to overwork themselves on the good days in order to catch up on things that they missed, whether or not it's cleaning the house or other kinds of stuff. This happens all the time when I'm treating people. The person will end up feeling better after a treatment, and then they will go home and they will clean their entire house because they haven't been able to do it in three weeks. And then they're like, oh, I'm dying the next day, right? So pacing is the difference between doing too many activities and not doing enough. So rather than doing everything on the good day, try to break it up and especially don't do it all at once. You know, if it is difficult to cut your lawn in front and back, maybe do the front yard one day and do the backyard the next day, right? So again, breaking up activities so you are in charge of how you plan, how you start, how you stop, and the changes that you're doing and not that you had to stop just because everything was awful, right? So taking rest breaks, you know, to break up the tasks, frequently changing tasks to limit repetitive movements. So if you're vacuuming for a little while and that bothers you, maybe you can vacuum for a little bit and then go fold laundry or something like that, right? Um, working slower is another thing. So one of the things that I'll talk about with people is this analogy of having a daily allowance. People that end up having chronic health issues, like I, I look at it as that you get a daily allowance of the amount of money that you get to spend, right? And maybe not money, but however you want to look at it, the amount of exertion that you get to do per day, right? So you get a daily allowance. And then every time that you do an activity that spends that allowance, obviously certain things are going to cost more than other things, you know? So it's one of those kind of things where you need to have that balance just right. If you don't spend enough, and if you don't do enough during the day, then you're going to eventually get worse and it will gradually happen over time. You'll have less ability to move, less ability to function. And this is those people that have a fear of movement. They don't want to actually move. They don't want to actually do things. On the other hand, if you go over your allowance, that means that you're going to end up having to debt 
like you're going to have debt and basically you need to pay interest, right? So it's going to set you back for a day or it's going to, you know, you're going to have problems. And that's that whole, like cleaning the whole house, you know, like, and paying for it later, right? What should happen is that you need to spend the right amount. And if you continually spend the right amount and you're not really going over and you're not, you know, like sitting on your butt and doing nothing, then eventually you're going to end up getting more allowance and you're going to end up being able to do more, right? So I personally like that one. A lot of people seem to like get it when it comes to that um, allowance analogy. And I, I kind of like that. So food choices. Food is definitely something that everyone can control. And obviously that's really good news. You can control what you eat eat during the day, what you drink during the day, and that's going to definitely impact your overall health and wellness. So different things like food choices, like one of these that, that has an issue is that people that are taking multiple different medications or certain types of pain medications like opioids, constipation ends up being an issue. So making sure that you get plenty of fiber, making sure that you get plenty of water can help to manage that when it, because obviously that can be annoying. You want to make sure that you're dealing with that, making sure that you're monitoring and limiting the amount of soda and tea, you know, maybe coffee. I like coffee, but, you know, like it depends on you and it depends on what's going on. Coffee can drive pain for some people. So, you know, limiting, especially when it comes to soda and like um, liquid calories end up having the tendency to kind of like you know, really cause people issues. So, you know, like, again, if you're drinking a lot of fruit juice, or if you're drinking a lot of um, soda or pop or whatever you want to call it, those are all um, things that can have issues when it comes to obviously like your, your, your health. So eating regularly helps to keep your energy levels up. You don't want to like go long times between it. Sometimes people like to do the intermittent fasting thing, and you got to see whether or not that works for you. Again, making sure that you have well-balanced meals. Again, you know, just like it shows on the picture here, there's multiple different colors that you have that are available to eat. Make sure that it's not just a white meal where you're eating chicken and potatoes and that's it, right? You want to have other kinds of stuff that's in there, right? You know, especially if they're like fried potatoes and they come in a box or a bucket right? That's problematic. So making sure you're talking with your doctor, pharmacist, your chiropractor, um, different stuff about the different foods. Um, but when it comes to talking to your doctor and your pharmacist, again, you need to learn if there's any specific kind of foods that you shouldn't consume with the specific medication that you're taking, right? Um, getting more specific, um, we talked a little bit before about acute versus chronic inflammation. Chronic inflammation, to kind of briefly go over it, is like a low level inflammation that your body can have. People that end up having higher levels of chronic inflammation have the tendency to have higher levels of pain. They also have the uh, tendency to develop certain diseases that can be associated with chronic inflammation. And I'm pretty sure that I have a whole nother lecture that I do on this. I don't think it's loaded on YouTube yet. Um, I'm going to try to load all of my lectures on YouTube um, in order to, uh, so you guys can see this stuff later on. But um, there's a bunch of different stuff that, that you can do. So there are inflammatory foods that will promote chronic inflammation. And I'm just going to kind of read through these real quick, just so you can kind of like list them out. So sugar, grains, right? So any type of grain has the tendency to promote a little bit of inflammation. Animals that have the tendency to eat grains. So grain fed animals are going to have more inflammation um, that's associated with them compared to um, grass fed type of animals. Dairy, legumes, so beans and different stuff like that, including soybeans, trans fats. So anything that says partially hydrogenated on the back. Um, and there's other things I'm sure that, that you can use that they will hide on the packages. So you got to read your packages. If it comes in a package, then it likely is inflammatory. So margarines, processed foods, other kinds of stuff like that. Oils from seeds. So canola oil or sesame oil or different stuff like that has the tendency to produce inflammation. Packaged foods, like I said, potato chips, and then people that have delayed onset food allergies that have the tendency to produce a little bit of toxicity, that is all inflammatory stuff. Anti-inflammatory foods. So let's kind of go through this. Fruits. Again, obviously, you got to be careful with the sugar. Um, if you're eating the skin, you want to try to eat organic if you can. You know, But if it's a banana, you're not eating the skin. Organic doesn't matter so much. right? Vegetables. Again, organic if you can. 
but vegetables should take up at least half of your plate. You know, I've had, uh, I have a thing on the food groups uh, on YouTube. So if you want to look at that, you can actually see about how you should actually kind of set your plate up. But I always say that vegetables should take up about half of what your plate is. Um, nuts, you can do that in moderation. Those have good fats in them, um, you know, but that can be an issue uh, because they do have a lot of fat. Cold water fish. So Alaskan or wild caught salmon, if it's Atlantic salmon, then it's typically farmed and it's not as good for you. It's better than multiple things, but it's not as good for you as if it's wild caught, because if it is farmed, they have the tendency to be fed grains and the grains actually decrease the amount of omega-3s that you actually have. Um, there's grass-fed animal products that we talked about. Potatoes can be good, eggs, different types of herbs and spices using garlic ginger or turmeric like curry spice um you know again those are things that can be supplements but they can also be things that you cook with um extra virgin olive oil is good for you butter is actually good for you coconut oil green tea drinking lots of water um, having dark chocolate it needs to be at least 60 percent cocoa in order for it to be um, good, right? You know, I wouldn't necessarily say special dark, but you know, all the ones that are like 70 and up, the, those are going to be good. And then red wine and stout beer are usually going to be things that are good for decreasing inflammation, right? And you're welcome for those. Um, there's obviously supplements that you can do. And I have a, uh, a thing on YouTube about supplements that you can take and like the top five or six supplements that you can take in order to help with chronic inflammation. So there's a bunch of different stuff with that. Um, physical activity. We talked about this a little bit before, but making sure that you get regular physical activity is going to help improve your strength in flexibility, your endurance, all of those things are things that everybody can use, but especially people that have chronic pain. So chronic pain can obviously lead people to rest more, um, which can impact their muscle mass. And if you decrease your muscle mass and uh, you increase your disability, that can be problematic. So obviously things that don't need to be like a high impact type of class, like a, a hit class doesn't need to happen. You don't need to go to CrossFit. Um, but you can do low impact activities. And even if you break that up during the day, it doesn't need to be that you do like a full hour of stuff or 30 minutes of stuff straight. That can be good, but if you can break it up a few times during the day, again, just like we talked about pacing before, if you did 10 minute sessions and you did that a few times a day, that can help improve your overall well being and help reduce your risk of long term disability. Um, there's exercises to, to try. Um, cycling, walking, swimming, yoga, Tai Chi, uh, all of those are different things that you can do. There's a, a fantastic uh, video on YouTube of a guy that is doing yoga through uh, Diamond Dallas Page, the wrestler. And basically, I believe his name is Arnold. And basically, he goes from having to walk with um, two, not canes, but basically two hand supports and he can't walk normally he had had issues because he had uh um he was like a paratrooper and other kinds of stuff and he had all this low back pain and he ended up doing this course and he goes from having to walk using these hand supports and not being able to support his body weight to over obviously several months being able to run and losing a whole bunch of weight and doing all kinds of stuff so you know there's there's all kinds of stuff that's available now, things that you can, whether or not you did want to go to a class or whether or not you wanted to go walking or swimming or any of that other kind of stuff, or even things that you can do from the comfort of your home. Like that's one of the things that happened with, um, with the pandemic here is that people have stuff that you can actually go online and you can actually take classes that way. Um, for people that are uh, doing things, again, you can do things with a friend. So sometimes if you're going to be doing it with a friend, that can be more enjoyable than doing it for like by yourself. So you can look up for meetup groups, like different, you know, running or walking groups, classes that you can offer. Um, having that friend sometimes leads to having accountability. So you actually like show up for it. Um, and when you're exercising at home, uh, try to turn on obviously music that you like, TV that you can watch um, to help pass the time, like if you're doing something like cycling or whatever. Okay, so easing stress and tension ends up being a big deal.
Uh, you want to decrease stress levels. You want to try to do different things to help to decrease that. One of the ways that you can do that is meditation. Um, there's a handful of different ways. It doesn't have to be a religious thing if that's something that you object to, but um, it can be, it doesn't have to be. Basically, all it needs to do is you work on slowing down. You can just focus on your breath and basically just focusing on breathing in and out, taking big, deep breaths. It can help to, you know, again, with meditation, it can reduce stress. It can reduce anxiety, help to control your emotional health, enhancing self-awareness, you know, improving your sleep helping to control pain, all of those are things that you're doing. So when someone meditates, it's like you pay attention to your breathing and then thoughts will creep into your head and you kind of like let them go and then try to go back to your breathing. That's practicing letting thoughts go that can be harmful, right? So if you're, you know, having issues with like anxiety and you want to like focus on your breath. It's kind of letting go of thoughts that, that you want to. It's a different neuroplastic kind of a, a neuroplasticity type of a thing. And they actually show people that do meditation will actually grow the size of their cortex and their brain. Um, if they do it in certain areas of the frontal lobe, they'll actually like do that um, just by meditating for a certain period of time. Another thing that you can use is apps that are online, right? So you can get an app on your phone and you can use a guided meditation. So there's a uh, one like waking up by Sam Harris is one of the, the ones that's there. There's a couple of other ones that are, that are there that you can look into. Um, sleep is obviously going to be a big deal. So people that have a lack of sleep, um, that's going to lead to fatigue, irritability, stress, tension, all of those things are going to make it harder to cope with pain. Um, you know, you can have problems with depression, sleeping too late, napping, and all of those other kind of things will have issues with sleep disturbances. So there's things that you can do in order to promote good sleep hygiene. Again, using your bed only for sleep is a good thing. Honestly, I don't think it's a good idea to have a TV in your bedroom. So they, you know, they say that it causes problems with sleep. It also decreases the amount of, uh, it, it decreases your sex life too. So there's all kinds of different issues that are associated with having things in bed. So whether or not that's, you know, a TV or whether or not you're, you know, breaking out your iPad, those are problems. So um, making the bedroom peaceful, trying to keep it tidy, trying to keep it clutter free. Um, and then when it comes to the nighttime routine, you can take a warm bath right before you go to bed. You can listen to music. You can read a favorite book, like an actual reading a book and not looking at a screen because of the blue light and other kinds of stuff, or you can redshift your devices if you are going to use them in order to kind of help with that. You can do some stretching. You can do some breathing. You can do some meditation. Um, you don't want to eat large meals right before bed, and you don't want to have, obviously, a lot of sugar or a lot of caffeine. Right. All of those are things that can affect the amount of sleep that you're getting. Again, focus is one thing. This is some of the stuff that we talked about, but your perception of pain changes according to what you focus on. If all you're focused on is your pain and that's all you talk about, then it's going to be hard to get away from it. This is kind of like that self-fulfilling prophecy or that idea of, you know, focusing on your pain makes you really good at telling whether or not you actually have pain. And it just makes the pain that you have become more amplified. So trying to change your focus, you know, again, meditation would be an example, doing a hobby, reading a good book, watching a favorite TV show, different stuff like that. Having a good conversation with somebody can help distract the mind from pain. This is one of the reasons why pain at night could be problematic because people at night no longer have some of these other things that are distracting them. And they'll have the pain as they just sit there staring at their TV or staring at the, at their ceiling or their clock, you know, watching the, the minutes tick off. So there's things that you can do in order to, you know, get rid of uh, or decrease the pain. So again, trying to shift your focus, you know, again, meditation, all that other kind of stuff, it is hard to do. But again, it is something that will become easier to do with practice, right? So it's something that you can get better at over time. Um, it, positive thoughts. It sounds a little bit like a kumbaya and a little bit hippy dippy maybe, but having positive thoughts are one of those things. It's the same kind of thing of having the attitude, you know, people that have the attitude that are, that they're going to beat cancer are going to do better off than people that don't, 
right? So it's the same kind of thing is that trying to be productive um, and happy is things that you can still do if you have pain, right? There's things that you can do with it. Again, cognitive behavioral therapy, um, that is one method of helping to manage pain, helping to deal with how you actually process the pain and how you kind of like form like your, you know, the story of your life or the, the different stuff like that. Um, you know, it's the way that you cope and the way that you try to get through the day that is going to be part of it. So people that go through and do cognitive behavioral therapy, they have been shown to alter the physical response of the brain by reducing stress. And again, stress levels are going to change the amount of output that you get. You can have more norepinephrine and serotonin, which are power pain, powerful pain controlling uh, chemicals. So, you know, again, by reducing the amount of the chemicals that you have, you can, um, you can end up improving the amount of pain that you have. Um, ergonomics is another thing to look at. So, and this is basically the last one before we wrap up. So ergonomics is going to be going through and kind of refining what your environment is in order to make it optimal for your use. So the goal of ergonomics is to minimize the risk of injury when you're doing certain tasks or tools. Um, there are um, ergonomics that you can use for when you're sitting at your desk or when you're standing at a desk or when you're doing different things. Um, there is something, I don't think I have it on the, the website when I'm doing, when I'm recording this, but I'm going to be getting it on pretty soon about different types of things about workplace ergonomics. But in the meantime, um, either you can go to my website that has that um, when I do get it up there, or you can Google workplace ergonomics and just look at the images. The images that are on there will basically show you the things that you can do in order to make sure that you have a good workstation setup, right? Um, and things that you can do at work, um, you know, working with your IT department, working with the HR department, seeing if you can get a different type of chair or whatever if you are going into the office, or making sure that you have a good setup at home and you're not just, you know, randomly working in a poor place at the kitchen table if you are working from home, right? So there's a handful of different things that are there. So when it comes down to it, again, there's a lot of different things that you can have when it comes to pain management. Again, chiropractic can offer a number of different treatment options, and we can talk about a lot of these different things, but there's chiropractic adjustments, there's Graston technique, kinesio taping, cold laser, massage, there's a whole host of different things. So um, when it comes down to it, uh, I'd like to thank you for, uh, for joining us. And if you have any questions, um, obviously you can put it in the chat, or if you're if it's on YouTube, you can put it in the comments below, and I'll try to answer. Uh, thanks again, and I appreciate your time. Thank you very much.